Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Pauline Jiu, and I'm uh, the second vice president for uh, the San Francisco chapter of NARF 65. Today, we have an exciting program with uh, my dear friend, Becky Mills, who was this, oh, I see Dave looming in the background. Hi, Dave. Paulina saying hi. Hi, Dave. Hi. <laughs> So uh, Becky is a former superintendent at Great Basin and a current board member, executive of the uh, National Great Basin National Park Foundation. Wow. So uh, as usual, with Zoom meetings, we're, I have everybody muted, I think it's Jesse, and we'll get to mute him. Hi, Jesse. Hi. Um, so that we don't have, get any distracting noises in the background. Uh, we are recording this session. And we will have a question and answer session monitored by Leslie uh, at the end. So if you could hold your questions till then, that would be great. So they can go through their presentations. You can use the chat or wave at Leslie, uh, scream at Leslie, whatever. So, <laughs> great. Um, anything else I need to remind them of, Martha? I think we're good. All right, so let me hand it over to Becky, our speaker. Welcome, Becky. Hi, hello all of you, my fellow federal retirees and current workers. Um, today, I'm going to be able to talk to you and I've also welcomed the superintendent of the National Park, Great Basin National Park here today and our program manager for the Great Basin National Park Foundation, Aviva O'Neill. And we're gonna be talking to you about Great Basin National Park the Great Basin Observatory and the role of national parks in conservation of our world. And I just wanna start with a little bit of background, thinking back to Henry uh, Thoreau in wildness is the preservation of the world. Words that now have very, very specific and dire meaning. I went to national parks when I was a very small child how many of you went to national parks as a small child? Just think back it, while we're talking about a memory that you have coming from that time. I won't ask around, maybe we'll have time for that a little bit later, but in my own case, I was taken to Yosemite. My dad actually had gone to Yosemite as a boy in the late 1800s. And um, I remember the the, relief map of the glacial changes in Yosemite Valley. So I've, I've never forgotten what that taught me about time and geology and the making of, of the present day world. Um, I got to join the National Park Service. I felt like I was the luckiest person in the world in 78 after a, a partial career in social work. And um, my first job was to manage the Young Adult Conservation Corps, a very exciting, very happy program, bringing people in who wanted to work for the parks, who didn't have jobs, getting work done for resource management and maintenance. It was, it was a win-win all the way around. I then became equal opportunity manager and I worked with Mary Dennery, who's on today and Pauline and Rich. Um, we had a class action complaint in the Western region at the time I was selected for the job. And that actually helped us to achieve real honest data-driven affirmative action um, with Pauline and Rich as my teammates. Pauline was the training officer at the time and Rich was in classification and was an incredible data manager, uh, which at that time was much harder. You know, we didn't have these computers and this technology the way we do now. Um, and we were actually able to implement uh, a good enough result that the Hispanic uh, Legal Action Fund, Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, which had filed the complaint decided that we had achieved a good faith effort. And indeed some of the uh, managers that we hired and recruited at that time are, um, are now retired superintendents. And, and one of them is actually the director of the California State Park System right now. So um, we're very proud of what we were able to do at that time with the help of our Washington office, Mary. 
And then I got what the National Park Service employees, many of them think is the plum job in the National Park Service, the job of superintendent. And um, it's sort of like a small town mayor. You're in charge of you know, the maintenance systems, the buildings and the utilities and the law enforcement systems, police and fire, emergency services, and the education program. And um, you have to manage the personnel and the budgets and um, community relations is a big piece of it too. So having said that, I'm gonna introduce you, James, because you know what it's like now. And and I've been 25 years out of it, so. <laughs> well, Becky, it still is like you're a small town mayor. See, it's it's a lot of fun, but uh, you certainly get all the problems too. So it's uh, it, 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 it kind of goes back and forth. I'll start by, you know, you, you kind of, you mentioned, you know, if we, any of us have um, memories when we were small. So mine is growing up in 29 Palms, California, with Joshua Tree, um, which is now a national park, but back then it was a national monument in my backyard. And me and this buddy of mine, we used to hike up in the mountains all the time. But this one time I did it by myself and we hiked up to the top of the mountain and there was this, there's this flat valley up on, up on this high elevation ridge. And whenever I would go there, it would feel like I was in the world all by myself. And one night I camped out up there and I remember looking across at this spring and there were like a whole herd of bighorn sheep. And I just thought it was the, the most magical thing I'd ever seen. So it was, it was fantastic. Um, as Becky mentioned, I am the superintendent of Great Basin National Park. Um, it's one of about 60 plus national parks in the country and one of about 430 units of the national park system. So the national park system is very varied and ranges from historic properties to um, wilderness parks out west. And actually I've worked at both historic parks and nature parks and, and they're both fabulous. Um, Great Basin is a 77,000 acre park. It's located in the high elevation mountains of the Southern Snake Range. Um, it's a beautiful area. The park goes from about 6,000 foot elevation up to 13,000 foot Wheeler Peak. Um, it preserves different eco zones within the Great Basin. It's meant to be a representative sample of the Great Basin. So you go all the way from sagebrush up to tree lifts above timberline up in the, up in the big high mountains. The oldest trees on the planet, um, the, uh, the, the bristlecone pines are located in the park. Um, if you've never seen them, Google them. There are these gnarly old trees. Um, and some of them have been dated at 5,000 years old. So they're, they're incredibly amazing. Beautiful high mountains and, and lovely country. Um, the amazing Lehman Caves, which is this beautiful intricate limestone cave that's, that's buried underground. Um, large animals, elk, bighorn sheep, deer, mountain lions, um, and 14,000 years of human history. So it's really an, a, an amazing place. The goal of the park is really twofold. One is to preserve a representative sample of the Great Basin. So that's kind of one of the core missions of the Park Service is preservation. Our other job is to help people understand that mission. And in the case of the Great Basin, our, our job is actually not just to interpret Great Basin National Park, but the entire Great Basin, which is a huge ge geographic area that includes almost all of Nevada, half of Utah, a little bit of California, um, about a quarter of Oregon and some of Idaho. So it's, it's a huge area. And I think for me, what's special about the Great Basin is that you are in the middle of nowhere, which is one of the rarest things anymore. And so when you are out here, you can be you know, in this beautiful area with solitude, um, quiet like you can't imagine. You, know, you, you almost have to concentrate on how quiet it is. And then one of the really special things and something that Becky's gonna talk more about are the dark night skies. The, um, you know, 90% of the population of the United States can't see the Milky Way anymore. Well, here you can. And it, it's beautiful, it just, you know, blasts out at you in the, in the dark night skies. And so we do all kinds of things to, to preserve and protect those. But I think for visitors, it's just wonderful to kind of experience that quiet and darkness that you really don't see anywhere. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Becky, but before I do, I would like to mention about the foundation that she's helping um, to, to, to lead and organize. Um, the Great Basin National Park Foundation is our friends group, and they help us manage the park by helping us do things that we can't do. And they are really a fabulous group. We are exceptionally lucky to have 
um, not only Becky, but a whole host of really amazing people that are on the board of the foundation. So it's a really, really good group. And with that, Becky, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thanks, James. I, I agree with James. There's something about the silence, uh, the vastness of the landscapes and the fact that in fact, it's a, it takes quite a bit of time to get to Great Basin National Park. So it's remote that um, reminds you of, what, of, of your place in the universe. It's a big statement, but it's true. Um, and thanks for that review of national parks and, uh, and the mission of the National Park Service and uh, the fact that Great Basin National Park um, interprets is required to by its law, by its legislation, the entire Great Basin. So I'm going to start to share a slideshow with you. And um, uh, I will first tell you that Aviva O'Neill, who's on the, um, who's, who's one of the little uh, boxes there, who's pictured, is our program manager for the uh, Great Basin National Park Foundation. And she's responsible for developing this lovely slideshow. Thanks, Aviva. Um, but I need to go back to the beginning. Here we go. Um, this is a view of the mountain Wheeler Peak, uh, which is the top of this wonderful Cirque Basin that you can see right in here, going back to my memory from Yosemite. This was carved out by a glacier, and there's a little remnant of that glacier that still remains that you can still see if you uh, hike up into this area. Um, so going back to wilderness and wildness is the preservation of the world. The parks are major players in educating and inspiring people to understand our, our planet. The Becky, can I interrupt just a second? Why don't you put it on the slide share view? So you just, so we get a, a larger presentation there. Oh yes, I think uh, Aviva actually told me how to do this. There we go. Try that. Okay, there we Great. go. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, when parks were first established, they were established because of conservation interests and business interests. And this still, you know, this is still a remaining uh, uh, coordination that is constantly being managed in national parks. Um, in 1916, the federal agency was launched, and so uh, we're barely over 100 years old as a federal agency. Um, in fact, this park is predated by its cave uh, in, in the middle of it called Lehman Caves, which James introduced to you, um, which was actually declared in 1922. But the park was established in 1986 as an example of the high desert, the 200,000 square mile Great Basin area, the basin and range topography uh, in which tectonic plates are stretching the continent apart. And so these mountain ranges have risen up and the basins have fallen. And um, I'll give you a little picture here. On the right, we have the Great Basin uh, hydrologic area. And um, it goes from, as James said, up there in Oregon, all the way down. Actually, this is a basin and range area, basin and range description. Hydrologic doesn't go as far down. But you can see in there all the different little mountain ranges and basins in between. And here, Salt Lake is the remnant of a great lake that used to be all through a good deal of this, maybe half, if you, my little arrow goes down. All, all of the way, um, sorry here, uh, between about the middle of the Nevada all the way over to the Wasatch Range, Lake, Lake Bonneville. And here we have, well, well, let me go back to this. You can see how far it is to get there. You can get there from Reno, you can get there from Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, all airports. And uh, there's a little airport in um, Cedar City. But if you're driving, it's going to take you 
10, 11, for people like myself, it takes me 13 hours to drive from Berkeley over to Great Basin National Park where the arrow is pointing. So it is in the middle of nowhere, but that's why it's so wonderful. Here on the left is just a picture of the park itself. That's the South Snake Range, as James mentioned, and the little town of Baker, nearly on the, uh, on the Utah border here and Wheeler Peak here. And this is a true picture. It looks almost like an artist drew it. Uh, it's so exquisite. These are these ancient bristlecone pines who have died, the two that are, that are in the foreground here. That's Comet Neowise in the background and the star-studded studded dark night sky. Uh, these trees can live, not live, but stay protected because their rosin is so tight. Uh, is, their bark is so tight that um, they don't get uh, invaded by beetles and other insects. They can last for another couple thousand years in, in their, you know, after they have died. And this gives you an idea of the Great Basin region, the valley below, the mountains above. Uh, these alluvial fans coming down from the mountains, the, the erosion that occurs in some areas, this is not one of them. You can actually see the shorelines of ancient Lake Bonneville. And yet at the same time, and I remember having grown up with the Sierras being my foundation national parks, um, to discover some riparian zones in this park that looked very much like the Sierras was such a a surprise to me. So you just get so much diversity at Great Basin National Park. This is one of the many little creeks. And this is Lake Stella Lake uh, with the Cirque Basin above it. Um, you're, you're looking at cosmic time. You're looking at geologic time, at glacial history, at island biogeography, meaning that because of Lake Bonneville, the mountain ranges became like islands. And so evolution occurred on each of the mountain ranges differently. And you have different um, kinds of the same species and actually some different species. Um, and here we are in the middle of Lehman Caves, just one of the many examples of how highly decorated this cave is. This is one of the most, if not the most popular site for visitors coming to Great Basin. They, there are tours given every day. They are often sold out, if not most of the time sold out. You can now reserve in advance for them. And if you get onto one of these tours, you'll be able to see the formation of the cave ongoing. So you can look up here. I think we even see one there, a little drop of water with its minerals attached, which is going to add to that stalactite there. So as you go through the cave, you're not just looking at the history, but you're actually seeing the process continue in the present. And here are these wonderful bighorn sheep that James mentioned. One of the jobs of in the national parks is to preserve the environment as it is when the park was established, as it was, as they understand the history. And in the case of the bighorns, they were, um, uh, uh, they became ill from the connection with domestic sheep. And part of the job of the National Park now is to bring them back and take care of this population that exists uh, up on Mount Washington today. And I think, I think maybe in another area as well, I have to talk, James will have to answer that. Um, there's another uh, ancient um, uh, fish called the Bonneville cutthroat trout that wasn't, we thought it was extirpated from the national park, but actually the species was found in one of the creeks and has now been put back and the population has been allowed to grow and develop into most of the streams of the Great Basin National Park, which has only happened over the last um, I would say 25 years. And here's the iconic bristlecone tree on Mount Washington, another very remote area on the, the South Snake, 
range with the great dark night sky below. I'll just take one mention of human history by showing you this pictograph. This is right over a cave. It's possible that the pictograph depicts some sort of hunting activity. We don't know. I actually consulted the cultural resources chief about this and she said that the park is now working on a national register nomination for this particular area as added recognition and protection for the unique forms of pictographs and petroglyphs that came from the Fremont culture, which predated the Western Shoshone, Goshute, and Southern Paiute that are the primary tribes in uh, the Great Basin area in that uh, South Snake, Snake Range area. So back to in wildness is the preservation of the world. Back in 1998, this foundation was started by Bonnie Bryan, who was the wife of Senator Richard Bryan, who's currently a member of our board of directors. Bonnie has since passed away, but she was highly respected and well-known throughout Nevada. Her, she had been the first lady of Nevada when her husband was governor. Uh, we were really lucky. She loved the park. Uh, the Senator loved the park and because of her, we started out with a board of directors that was basically movers and shakers of, uh, of Nevada. And um, we've added Utah, which is a, a large portion of the Great Basin in Utah as well, to uh, Utahns to our National um, Park Foundation Board, as well as Californians. Um, here's bats, there are a lot of bats in the, in the park and some of our natural resource preservation Managers are studying them and protecting them in the various caves. There are many other caves in Great Basin National Park. Here's our astronomy program for visitors. And the foundation has purchased numbers of the telescopes that you can uh, look through if you go to visit the park at the time they have the astronomy program. And here again is another picture of the Cirque Basin up in the Wheeler Peak area. The foundation has, um, contributed over $2 million to the park since its founding. And recent uh, aspects of what we've supported are these wayside exhibits, a, an exhibit about a Winchester rifle that was discovered leaning against a tree not very long ago, um, a relief map dating back to my wonderful memory of Yosemite. We now have one of the Cirque Basin uh, of Wither Peak. And, uh, emergency medical and astronomy program telescopes. We originally in the foundation launched a bridge. We built a little bridge over Baker Creek, but that allowed people not to have to ford the creek. They could actually cross it and it opened up a bunch of front country for visitors that had been difficult to reach before. Moving on to the specifically dark sky connections. Here we are with one of the dark rangers, a summer seasonal employee, or I think an intern, right, Aviva? Yeah, I think an intern, uh, with one of the Celestron telescopes that the foundation donated. And here's Aviva herself demonstrating the Great Basin to um, young people in our, our outreach program that she manages. This is our Great Basin Observatory. The, the observatory was a, vis, a vision of one of the park rangers and it grew to get the support of the park superintendent. It was brought to the foundation as a hope for the future and the foundation decided we're going for it. And we raised 850,000 that not only built this observatory, but it uh, allowed for a five-year operations reserve fund. Um, in 1916, we had what's called the first light, which means the telescope opens for operation and uh, starts to view the night sky. And there you see the Milky Way in the Great Basin National Park dark sky. The foundation works with the park and four universities who are partners in managing this observatory, Concordia University in Irvine, California, 
I can explain these connections to you if you're curious. University of Nevada at Reno. Western Nevada College is in Carson City, and it's a community college that feeds into University of Nevada at Reno, has it, its own observatory, but it doesn't have the dark night skies. And Southern Utah University, uh, who is actually the closest of our partners to the national park, I mean, of our partner universities to the national park. And here you see on the left, uh, undergraduates at Concordia wow. University, and they are um, using the computer to input the coordinates to tell the telescope over here on the right, how to fo where to focus and what to focus on and uh, to clear up the focus. So they put in the coordinates and remotely this telescope moves it focuses on that patch of the dark night sky that they have uh, told it to do. And then uh, it starts to take pictures and the pictures are transmitted digitally. There's no eyepiece here. No visitor goes to the observatory and looks through an eyepiece to see the night sky. It's all remotely operated. And it means that eventually at some point in the future when we are in a position to share time with others, you can be anywhere in the world, world where you have internet access and you would be able to um, get pictures from and focus on parts of the dark night sky that you're researching. These are a couple of the very spectacular pictures that the observatory has taken. One of the big things that the astronomers told us when we first started working, uh, trying to get endorsers so that we could raise the funds and build this, was that because of the dark night skies, um, you can be in many places in the world that have wonderful telescopes, much bigger telescopes, but they need to check with some place like the Great Basin Observatory, either to triangulate and get a better sense of the position of where they're looking and where they're studying, or in many cases to continue their research because they are so limited when they're going to one of the major observatories in terms of the time that they're allowed and the expense of buying that time. So this kind of observatory, the astronomers told us, is gonna make a difference in the discoveries in the next stage of astronomy in the world. Here is a slide showing you what we're doing for the Reach for the Stars program. Aviva again has been responsible for developing all of this, the classroom lesson plans, which are next generation science standard plans. There are 55 of those lesson plans now on the Great Basin Observatory website. The star box is an actual tangible box. Over on the right, you see some of the various ingredients that are in a star box. And these are physically distributed to the elementary schools in rural Nevada and rural Utah that surround the park. Uh, and again, these digital lesson plans were, were developed so that they could be used during the COVID time um, in these various types of learning environments. I love this, <laughs> I love this slide. Over up here clockwise uh, from the left, upper. The girl in the middle is the sun. And all these children around her are animals and plants that depend on the sun. So this is a little exercise that shows the kids why we need the sun to survive and um, what, you know, what these various an animals and plants do, like photosynthesis or whatnot. Over here, you've got kids playing at being animals who need dark night skies to survive. So Aviva sets this up. There are three cones. Here's this one right here. Under two of them, you don't have dark night skies. Only under one do you have it. So if you're one of the animals that pulled, you know, looked under your cone and your cone didn't have dark night skies, you're not gonna fare as well as these other animals who need darkness in order to survive and to do their hunting. Over here, these kids look very happy to have learned how they can control uh, the pollution of the dark night skies by lighting. It's called light pollution. 
It's a growing concern. You probably all know about it. But if you can put this kind of a top on your street lighting, you will protect the safety of your people under the street light and you will not pollute the dark night skies. And finally over here, these girl, little girls are learning why the moon changes shape, which has all to do with the position of the sun and the earth vis-a-vis -vis the moon. So this is just, and these are just examples of the games that Aviva has developed and, and others, I know she's worked with others to develop them. I'm now gonna just mention to you that uh, my particular job on the board of directors right now as interim director of the, or chairman of the development committee is to develop our sponsor program and we call it the guardian of the park program. I want you all to know that you have no obligation to donate. You can get on our newsletter if you wanna submit your email address to myself or to, eat, to Aviva, um, but you can also donate. And I'm in, the, I'm in the business now working with Aviva, trying to expand our support base so that we can continue to uh, maintain a staff and continue to develop with this new operation that we have of managing not only the observatory itself, but also this outreach program called Reach for the Stars. And I just wanna recommend these three websites. The uh, park website is this one. I think Pauline, you're gonna be able to send this out to people after. Can you do that? Yes. Yeah, okay. And this one, greatbasinfoundation.org, that's the actual foundation site. And then there's the Great Basin Observatory site that has the lesson plans and uh, quite a bit of other information about the observatory, like a virtual tour of the observatory, um, but specific to the dark night sky preservation and the operation of the observatory itself. And, and I wanna stop the share now and just conclude by saying there's a crying need, as I know we all share this, um, for people to understand that humans interact with life on earth and that our survival depends on preservation of our climate. Uh, and in that sense, because of the dark night skies, we are able to see, not just look online or look at a photograph, but actually see through with our own eyes, if, if you know, for those of us who can, um, where we are vis-a-vis -vis an enormous, vast, very mysterious universe about which we're learning lots and lots and lots, but, but so much more to be learned. And can see like that wonderful image that we've all seen of the earth uh, taken from the first, uh, you know, the moon expedition of that little blue ball with gorgeous blue and white ball floating in space. It's a very desperate time right now. And, and I look at national parks as really being places that people go for recreation and, and can at the same time gain understanding and, and more than that, strengthen their own commitment to cons conservation so that we can possibly increase the numbers of people in the world who will work for the, the kind of change that we need to uh, combat climate change. And I hope that you'll check, you'll join our newsletter um, and want to learn more. And I'm going to ask, just open it up for questions at this point. I'd like to thank both of our speakers, James and Rebecca, or can we say Becky? And yeah. so if any of you have questions, you could either raise your hand or put your question in the chat box. Oh, and you have to remember to unmute yourself. Hi, Carol. Hi. I just, I may have missed something, but how do you get into this park? Where is the entrance? Where do you have to go to get in? Uh, well, I could answer, how do you get in? I'll just say, how do you go? You can drive, you can fly and drive. So you'd ha you have to pick up a rental car or, yeah, I guess you have to pick up a rental car. But, but where do you go? That's my so you're, you're, you're going on Highway 50, 
if you're driving from the Bay Area, where I think all of you live, correct? You're in the you're in the San Francisco area. Yep. Um, so you're you're heading on Highway 80 towards re, towards Sacramento, and then you're gonna you can take 80, which is what I do, and you can then uh, you veer off and turn towards Highway 50 at the Fallon connection. You can also just drive 50. I don't know about right now after the fires, but um, you can go either way, 80 or 50. And there are other ways as well. And then I love 50 because you're going over the basin and range if you're driving 50. 80 is a little different. It goes way up north, takes more time. But on 50, you're going up and down, up and down the whole way. And, um, and you're going through land that is in Nevada, it's 81% federal land in Nevada. And so because of that, you don't have a bunch of billboards. So you're actually driving all the way, almost all the way across state with nothing but a natural environment surrounding you. It's a quite beautiful experience. And Baker, Nevada, the little town by Great Basin National Park is right at, almost at the Utah border, I guess about five miles. Do you want to- That's for the other parts of the answer, James? I mean, you can go from Las Vegas, you can go from Santiago, Chile. <laughs> What was, the, what was the question? How will she get there? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think- wonder the, where the actual entrance is. Like, where do you go into the park? So the most in popular Nevada? place to go in is at in Baker, Nevada, Baker, which is Nevada. the grand metropolis of the area, population 68. Um, and from there you go up in the mountains. There are some kind of more wilderness areas you can get in, but for the most part, that's the way in is through Baker, Nevada. And there's no fee station. No. Nope. There's no lineup at the fee station. Because <laughs> there isn't any. No. You just drive in. So there's no visitor center or anything like that? We do have two visitor centers. So when you come in and in, in Baker, so before you come into the park, there is the Great Basin Visitor Center. And that kind of gives you an overview of the Great Basin. And then once you get into the park, there is, um, there's a building at Lehman Caves and there's the Lehman Caves Visitor Center. And that one is where you can, you know, get on your cave tour. And it also talks about dark night skies and caves. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Jesse, did you have your hand up? I, I'm sorry, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Jesse. Yeah, are there, are there places to stay uh, once you get to the park other than perhaps outdoor camping? There are a few, but I would say primarily people do camp here. So we have five um, kind of improved campgrounds and gosh, probably 150 campsites, which for a little park is actually quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So something like a quarter to a third of all our res visitors um, camp out. Um, there are other places you can stay at hotels, but they're very, very limited. So there may be 30 beds in Baker, um, the border uh, um, on the Nevada, Utah line has maybe 20 more rooms. And then a lot of people will stay in Utah. Frozen, James. You were saying Utah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so a, a lot of people who who want a, a hotel room, if there's not enough space, they will stay in Ely, Nevada. And there's there's a lot of hotels in Ely. Okay. And then there's and one really is, detail, um, uh, resort area in a beautiful canyon that uh, borders on the national park called the Hidden Canyon Retreat. Retreat? Yeah. And are these campsites uh, accessible by car or must you hike into them? The, um, most of them are accessible by car. And in fact, recently we've been fortunate to get money to rehabilitate most of them. So, so they, they're, they're in really outstanding condition. Three of them are paved, um, even to the campsite. The other two are dirt campsites, but they're frankly, they're accessible to any vehicle. There are some more backcountry campsites that you need to camp to, but frankly, we, you know, those are, those are much far less a number. Okay, I have, Jesse, did you have another question? 
No, not at the moment. Okay, I have two questions. And is there follow up with the children after they participated in the programs? And are there water issues at the park? Ah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, let I'll tell you what, I'll take, I'll take the water one and maybe Aviva can take the one about the follow up. Um, I think the short answer to the water question is yes, there are water issues at the park. I mean, I, I'm somebody, I told you I grew up in the Mojave Desert and so I'm used to the desert, but my desert at home, where I came from, there's really, frankly, very little water. Um, what's unique about the Great Basin is there's, um, there's quite a bit of water. So, you know, within the park, there are half a dozen perennial streams that flow year round. And, um, and so people fight over that water quite a bit. Um, and the, recently there was a, there was a, a long-term project proposal by the city of Las Vegas to build a pipeline you know, more than 200 miles up to the park and basically take um, a lot of our water back to Las Vegas. Um, that, that project it lost a, a, a lawsuit recently, although we're not sure whether they're, they're really um, out for the long term. So there's, there's a lot of water concerns. Aviva? Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, well, we, we do do um, after each, uh, classroom presentation or, or program, we do evaluations with the educators, um, with the teachers, you know, so that we can try to understand what student learning is occurring and how we could um, refine whatever it is that we're, we're delivering to make it better. Um, but we, we haven't had, you know, interviews with the students themselves, except for once they're at the level of um, high school or college students that are working with the GBO in a, in a, you know, a longer fashion, not, not just a classroom presentation or program, but, um, but they're working for months with us. We have tried to, um, we, we've in, informally done kind of surveys with them to also try to understand the student learning and, and um, what's been different than they thought it would be, or what they've gained that they didn't maybe realize they were going to gain. And we're actually um, hoping to start in, in just the next month or so, um, a, a much more comprehensive look at student learning in regards to those uh, Great Basin Observatory scientists and users, um, which would have a, a survey in the beginning of their work and one um, at the end of each semester. Um, and, and that would really show us how on a more data-driven way, how they're learning over time. Thank you. And you know, I have a question. Um, when it comes to the size, Great Basin, I think you said it was, was it 77,000 acres? Mm -hmm. Is that considered small, medium, or large when it comes to national parks? So, so I would say 77,000 acres is, is pretty small for a national park. So for example, when I worked at Mojave National Preserve, um, that was 1.5 million acres. Wow. So, so I'd say those, those are the large parks. I mean, there are far smaller parks um, that are only a few acres, but those tend to be historic sites. So for example, you know, I manage the Springfield Armory in, in Springfield, Massachusetts, which was, you know, you know maybe a hundred acres. Um, so those can be quite tiny little parks. Okay, thank you. Well, Leslie, Anybody? I have another answer yes. for you because, uh, in our previous conversation, you asked about the pictographs and what they meant. Oh, yes. And so Eva Jensen, who works for James and who is the cultural resource manager said, they, she's been told by a specialist in rock art that those pictographs are unique. Um, I, the slide doesn't actually show you this particular section of that, of those pictographs, but there, there are some that look like they might be a, two people, but, but they do not know yet. Mm. So that's, even though I, I knew that when I was back there as superintendent, I didn't know if perhaps more was understood. And she said, actually, not a whole lot more. They're still investigating it, but they are unique. And uh, if I remember correctly, and if it's still correct, James, um, and it has something else hasn't been discovered, the Fremont culture, uh, which was a Southwestern culture, lived in pit houses. 
their westernmost uh, extension, the furthest that they explored west, was at the border of the Great Basin National Park in an in archaeological site that you can actually visit. It's on the BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land that, um, that borders the park. But these pictographs are Fremont culture pictographs. So they, and it's, it's still the westernmost yep. um, expansion of the Fremont culture. They lived when um, there was still a lot of water coming down into the Baker Township area. Um, and by looking at that archeological site, you can understand better uh, that there was water there. <laughs> you know, there's not now, except groundwater, which is being pumped out for ranching. Thank you, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. And it's interesting, someone brought up about the ranching and being, or is, is the park surrounded by BLM land? And is that land used for grazing? And is that having an impact on the, on the national park itself? So yes, so the, the, the um, almost all the area around the park is BLM land. The, 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 some exceptions to that would be a few um, private parcels but the vast majority of land is, is managed by the BLM. And um, the park actually had grazing on it when it was created, and that was one of the compromises. And that was one of the accomplishments of some of the earlier superintendents like Becky, who were able to work out an agreement with area ranchers so there is not grazing in the park. Um, and I would say um, that, yeah, the answer to your last question is yes, grazing has ecological impacts. Certainly when you look at the landscape in the park that hasn't been grazed now for several decades, um, there's a noticeable difference between the grazed and the ungrazed areas. I'd like to just add that because it, it, we, I got to work with the ranchers during this very special period when they really wanted to, to they wanted to make the change. And it wasn't an easy change for them. Um, we, we have, there's a ranch just below the, the park. You, there's actually an exhibit that was developed during that time that you can see just below the park boundary up the hill a little ways from the ranch. And you can look out onto the property of the Baker ranches. And these people uh, are the descendants of, of family ranchers that developed there. At this particular moment in time, they decided they wanted to um, uh, cooperate with the park to stop grazing on the park lands and um, be, be uh, compensated for that. But legally, the federal government can't sell what is its own land. So um, this had been worked out in other areas that we weren't the first, but it was a, a, a bigger, a, quite a big operation that went on with us. We not only coordinated with the ranchers, but with not only BLM, but Forest Service that also had ranching and had grazing on its property and, um, uh, and had to consult widely with various entities on it. Eventually the conservation fund, which, was, which broke off from the Nature Conservancy a few decades ago, raised the funds. It was the private donor, the conservation fund that compensated the ranchers, but all the compensation was based on actual market appraisals mm -hmm. of what their grazing was worth to them in real estate value, which the park could not participate in, given our legal, um, you know, the fact that we couldn't sell our own grass. So um, ultimately, the, the, don't, the conservation fund compensated the ranchers and the ranchers donated their grazing permits. And then the senator the one of the founding he was a congressman at the time, Harry Reid, who had become a senator. He he saw to it that an amendment was placed in the enabling legislation that allowed this to happen, since originally uh, they had guaranteed perpetuity ranching, hmm. um, and he saw to it that the legislation got changed, and then the regional director of the Park Service um, declared that um, for resource benefit the park should not ever again invite grazing on its land. Okay. So that was the process and it ended well. It was amicable. 
um, it was a model actually that other places are looking at now. I've gotten calls recently from Point Reyes. If some of you may know about the controversy at Point Reyes now. Right. Um, it was also just very, very exciting to work with the ranchers and well, I can the Forest Service and BLM had to do a whole lot of, it was like musical chairs. Cause if you, if you had a certain number of cattle grazing on the, on the park, you had to find another place for them to graze. So in some cases you bought land, but if you didn't have that money, then you had to sort of work with the Forest Service and BLM to graze that many cattle on their land. And in one case, we had a rancher who actually wanted to retire his grazing operation. Okay. Yeah. Longer answer than you wanted. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Thank you. I have one one other question, um, which you may have answered, Becky, because when I was typing um, a, a chat message here, what changed the ranchers' minds about growing? Um, you got frozen there, but I think I know. I think I know the question. I, I should really ask them again. At the time, I felt that they were seeing uh, the conservation movement uh, was developing. There was a lot of public controversy about public lands grazing. And the Secretary of Interior at that time, Bruce Babbitt, was proposing to raise the grazing fee. And uh, the fee for grazing one cow and calf uh, for one month was set um, at a federal level. Um, it turned out in the long run that the grazing fee was not changed, but um, I think they, they were looking at the future and looking to secure their operations. And they were concerned that, um, you know, they didn't know what the future might hold as ranchers. <laughs> in general, always have to be concerned about, right? Mm -hmm. They're always looking at the future, I mean, in terms of climate change and all, the, the water supply is a big issue right now for ranching. Sure. Right. If, there aren't, if there aren't any more questions, I'm gonna turn this over to Pauline so she can make her closing remarks. Great, thank you, Leslie. Well, okay. I wanna have everyone join me in thanking James Wosley, the superintendent, Aviva O'Neill, and Becky Mills for yes. her great presentation. I think we learned a lot. And yes. I think all of us wish we could just teleport over to see the night skies <laughs> and go to drive. It would be a lot harder for us. But it was really nice to be able to get a sense of uh, the night skies. So thank you very much. Let me yeah. also uh, mention that uh, we are an organization, Most I think everybody else is on the well, well, we'll talk to James about joining NARS uh, later. <laughs> I'm also the recruiter too for the chapter, but uh, in October, we'll have Ann Lindsay from uh, Department of Labor and she'll talk to you about your benefits, your retirement benefits or health benefits and answer questions. So um, that's our October program. And in November, we'll have um, a health fair. So we'll have representatives from health insurance companies talk about their programs for open season. So without further ado, I thank everybody for participating. And Becky, I hope to see you soon. Say bye to Dave for me. Okay. And thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye.